Amen. All right. The title of my sermon this morning is Conflicts in Marriage and Dealing how, how to Deal with Conflicts in Marriage. And <clears throat> this is something I want to make sure that I, that I preach here. I think it's very important, actually, just to know how to deal with conflicts in marriage. When I talk about conflicts in marriage, I'm not talking about small things. I'm not talking about minor things. Um, everyone's going to have that. Every marriage is going to have its own share of, of um, arguments and fights and, and, and times where you don't get along because we're sinful people. And when you get uh, in close proximity, especially when you're living with someone, uh, you have a tendency to have some conflict. So that is a normal thing. But I'm going to be referring to when, when things start to get a little bit um, excessive as far as having problems. And it seems to be something that you know and you recognize as having serious issues in your marriage. I want to give some good counsel and advice on how to deal with those things. Of course, if you're not married, it's still good, especially if you're ever planning on getting married, to know this information. It's also good just in conflict resolution anyways on how to deal with things. And um, it is extremely important because there have been things going around that I don't uh, agree with at all, and it's going to be um, covered this morning as well a little bit. And this isn't an attack. This isn't a red herring. This isn't something that is like, you know, some personal agenda. This is teaching the Bible and actually teaching something that's really important. And it's stuff that's come up, and I've, I've even heard this week of things in my own church in Norcross of people giving really bad advice and bad counsel on how to deal with things in your marriage. So we're going to get to that a little bit later, but um, this is extremely important and there's a really dangerous way that's being uh, set forth and, and it's important to not ever get to that point. And even just recently I was giving counsel to uh, a family, to a couple that needed help in their marriage. And that's my first point. If you see things getting really bad, it's okay to ask for help and to seek counsel. Amen. So this morning we're seeking counsel and you know, the, the most important counsel, the best counsel is going to come from the word of God, Amen. right? So the best counsel you're going to get is going to be from someone, especially that has wisdom and knows the word of God and can help guide you and, and instruct you on what the word of God says so that you can use scripture to help guide your life. Because look, I don't think that the Bible is unclear about how we ought to live our lives, about how we ought to raise our children, about how we ought to have marriages, about how we ought to do the, some of the most basic things in this life. I think the Bible is very clear. And whenever it's not explicit on whatever commandments are given, it is given through principle. It is given through um, just, just overall principles on, on how we ought to live. So, um, you know, we started there in Proverbs 19, the Bible says in verse 20, hear counsel and receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. There are many devices in a man's heart and nevertheless the counsel of the Lord that shall stand. We need to get counsel from the Bible, from the word of God, obviously on what we need to do and how we need to handle things, whether it be conflict resolution or anything else in this life. The Bible says in Proverbs 11, you have to turn there, verse 14, where no counsel is, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Amen. Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. So getting good counsel, receiving counsel not, you know, from the word of God, yes, but also from people who do know the word of God and people who are successful. If you want to get counseling, if you want to understand how to do things better, if you're struggling in an area of your life, it does make sense to go and talk to someone who is very successful in that area also. You know, people who are doing really well, that's going to be the person you're going to want to seek counsel from. And, you know, the Bible talks about the elder men and elder women in a church. You know, you ought to be able to look to them as people that you can ask questions about and say, hey, how, you know, you've made it this far. You're married. You've had kids. You've, you know, you've raised this family. What advice can you give me? And that's, it's, you know, even the Bible teaches that the elder women are supposed to teach the younger women to be good, chaste, discreet, right? Keepers at home, to love their children, to love their husbands. Like this is something that ought to be being done within the church. 
So yes, obviously the pastor's role is important in, in preaching the word of God, but there ought to be more people within the church that have wisdom as well and people that you should be comfortable going to to seek counsel from and be able to, to, to ask help for. And when things are getting really out of control in a marriage, seeking counsel is a good thing. Just asking, say, hey, what, you know, what, what do you recommend? What do you suggest? What, what do you think the Bible's teaching here? How do I deal with this? And obviously, just because someone's giving you advice doesn't always make it good advice, right? We still always need to, to compare what we hear against the word of God. It all needs to be taken in. But, you know, when you could ask a few people and you could see, hey, these people have been successful. They seem to be really godly people. They seem to know their Bible well. You know, it's, it's a good idea to ask, ask about that. And again, we're talking about when things are getting pretty serious. And you're worried about your marriage, maybe even breaking up or splitting up. You know, that's definitely a good time to seek help and to swallow your pride. And yeah, you know what? I get it, especially as a man. It might seem embarrassing to have to ask someone and just be like, hey, I'm having these problems. Right? Because for most people, you see an outward appearance and everything looks just fine. And that's how most people, you know, most problems that people have in their life, it's behind closed doors. You don't necessarily know anything's going on. So it could, it could seem a little embarrassing to have to ask for help, but you know what? That marriage is worth it. It's worth it. it, it it's something that you ought to be fighting for. It's something that you ought to be seeking counsel on if you need that help. Uh, turn if you would. Actually, so getting advice obviously is important, but now the, the second point I want to bring up, and these aren't in any real particular order. It's just kind of the way it worked out with the flow of going to Proverbs and other, chap and other chapters and stuff. But um, you could turn to Proverbs 15. It's just a few pages back. And there's, there's so many causes for conflict in marriage. I can't cover them all <laughs> in one sermon. There's a lots of things that can happen. But I'm, I'm trying to cover things that would be, how do you deal with things and how can you keep things from getting too far out of control. And my next point is, has to do with anger management. Being able to control your anger. And look, this goes, this is important for everything, right? Not just marriage, it's, this just is how our lives ought to be. Is being able to maintain composure, to be temperate, to be in control of your body, of your actions at all times. And one is the most likely time to get out of control is when your emotions get really high. And what happens, especially in marriages, you got people who usually things start off kind of small, but then there's button pushing that goes on, right? And the more you live with someone, the more you know about them, and the more you get to really know what are the things that are going to set that other person off. And we as human beings have a tendency to want to, you know, oh, you said something I don't like, I'm going to push that button, Right? And then what happens? Well, you get that, that big emotional response. You get, you get, and look, that's not right. We shouldn't be seeking to push other people's buttons. But it does happen, right? So it's, it's just one of those things that it's not right. It's wrong to be provoking people and to be saying hurtful things and to just try to, to spite people or whatever with your mouth. But when you understand, hey, this is also going to happen. So if it does happen to me, I want to make sure that I can control myself that I have the temperance, I have the ability to not fly off the handle and act crazy. Because look, let's face it, when the, the worst things that happen, whether it's the worst things that are said or the worst things that are done, are going to happen when people are just really emotional, right? And when you get really emotional, it's a bad time to be making decisions because you have a tendency to make the wrong decision. Because when you get really emotional, it's easy to get in the flesh and then react that way. So again, we're talking about conflicts in marriage, and when things get really bad, especially within your marriage, you have to take this counsel to heart. And hey, we're all sitting here this morning, and you can, you can be in an environment where you've got a cool head. You're not all worked up, right? And let these things sink in so that later on, in the heat of the moment, maybe you can reflect back on some of the Word of God and some of this counsel you receive and take a break and take a pause, and, you know, I, I'm going to be sharing a little bit, sorry, honey, about <laughs> our life um, just because I think it's relatable, because it's, it's real life for me, 
And I think I have a great marriage. I love my wife. I love my kids. I think everything's going well. From my perspective, everything's good. So, but is it perfect? No. No, we have our problems, right? But, and, and, and this takes time usually too. And you got to understand that if you're going through problems in your marriage, understand, it, you know, if, especially if things get really bad, it didn't get really bad overnight. And it's probably not going to get fixed overnight either. It's going to take a lot of time. So you're going to need long suffering and patience to get through and to, and to continue through and to see that marriage through to the end because you've made the vow. I mean, look, it's important. What, what therefore God had joined together, the Bible says, let not man divide asunder. And we ought never to see marriages end in divorce. It really is uh, the last thing. It shouldn't even enter our minds. It should be something that's done. So once you've entered into that commitment of marriage, you, you, we need to figure out a way. Though things are getting bad. Look, we've got to figure out how to make this work, right? And controlling your anger is going to be a really helpful way of, of keeping things together and not letting things get out of control. The Bible says in Proverbs 15, verse number one, a soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. I mean, this is straight out of scripture, right? And this was exactly what I was talking about, pushing buttons. Grievous words, they're going to they're gonna stir up that wrath, right? If things are people are already angry, it's just going to make the problem worse. Think, you know, take a second and think and just hold back and be like, man, you know, learning to, to, to hold your tongue is a very important life skill. <laughs> You know, we could read in the book of James how the tongue is, is an evil and, you know, it's unruly and, and how, you know, all the bad things that come from our tongues and the power of our tongues, the power of our words. Look, it's really important. So being able to control that alone can have significant uh, benefit in your marriage. And sometimes, you know, hey, whether, whether you're right or wrong, even when you're right, it's good to sometimes just withhold your tongue and allow uh, things to pacify, to get some more peace, to get the, the tensions down and, and the, the emotions down before continuing on. I'm not saying you just drop it. I'm not saying you never talk about things. But when you're having issues, when you're having conflict, the best thing to do is sometimes just to step away. And this is what I was talking about. You know, th this is something that... that my wife and I are very different on when we would have issues. She's the type of person that once things start going bad, she just wants to, to just kind of go somewhere else and not talk about it, right? But I'm the type of person that's like, no, let's get this settled right now. Like, we need to talk about this now. I want to get done with it now. This needs to be done now. Like, we're talking about it. Let's do it. And we're totally different on that, okay? But it doesn't help anything when she wants to take a break and I'm trying to press the issue, to keep pressing the issue. So this is an area that I had to learn just in my own life to be able to say, okay, you know what, maybe this is better. Because it doesn't, you know, we, know, we both know it's not settled. We're not pretending like, like anyone's winning the argument. It's just a wise thing to be able to take a step back and say, okay, well, we could, we could come back to this, just cool down, and then revisit again. And the Bible says a soft answer turneth away wrath too. So um, when, when things do start to get a little heated, if you can get really good control over yourself, remember, if you could, if you could just say something kind or something soft, that can de-escalate the situation. Because, hey, look, this is your spouse we're talking about, right? You love your spouse. In the moment, you may not feel that so much, but you do love the spouse. That's why you're with them, and we're trying to make things work. Look at verse number 17 there in Proverbs 15. The Bible says, Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. A wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger appeaseth strife. Look, we all want to have love, and, and this is showing the importance of, of having love in the household. It's way better... You know, even if you don't have very much money and, you, you know, you have a dinner of herbs, right? A vegetarian meal. And look, I'm not a vegetarian by any stretch of the imagination. I love me a good steak and I would much rather prefer a good steak all the time. But he's saying it's better to have that salad 
if you got love there and you could have that, that nice meal together than it is to have that best steak and filet mignon, but there's hatred there, right? So, and this is something too, and there's a, there's a little bit of wisdom. I think we glean even just from that first verse, I was going to focus more on the second one, but you know, your marriage is more important than how much money you can make. Amen. And look, as, as husbands, we need to provide for our families. We need to provide for our wife. We need to provide for our family. And that's one way, that's one way that you show your love for your wife is that, you, hey, I'm going to work hard and provide for you and I'm going to provide for the family. But don't get so focused on that. Well, I have to work, I have to work, I have to work, I have to work. Once your needs are met, to get so hung up and focused on work that it, it comes at the cost of a relationship that you have with your spouse. And yeah, you're working all the time, but then there's, there's despite, there's anger, there's resentment at home because you're gone all the time. When you don't necessarily have to be gone all the time, you could still provide and be there. It's just much better if you could have love and maybe have some less things than having all the stuff, but your relationship totally suffered and, there, and there's hatred there. Because at the end of the day, we all should know this, our life is not about stuff. It is about people. It's about relationships. It's about serving Christ, right? And how do we serve Christ? We, we serve others. I mean, that's, that's what matters. And who cares what things you have? That means nothing. It's all going to be gone. Our relationships matter. They matter. That, they, these, this should be some of the most important stuff for us is, is how we are dealing with people in our life. And then, of course, at verse 18, a wrathful man stirreth up strife, but he that is slow to anger. If you can be slow to anger, you can appease strife. That helps to reduce the fighting and the striving if you're allowing yourself to be real slow to anger. Uh, flip over to chapter 16. Verse 32, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. So it's talking about, a, it's comparing a mighty man and someone who's able to go in and conquer a city, which you say, wow, that's a great man, someone who could go in and do that. But it says, if you're slow to anger, you're even better, and if you could rule your spirit, that you're, that's, that's more valuable than being a mighty man that could go in and conquer a city. Being able to rule your own spirit well. I mean, this is what the Bible says, right? We're looking at Bible this morning. This is good wisdom from the scripture. And then chapter 19, again, where we started in verse 11, the Bible says, the discretion of a man deferreth his anger and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. To pass over transgression and you know, being able to have forgiveness, have grace, allow for transgressions to not uh, weigh you down, to not uh, cause that anger is a good thing. It is, um, it says this is glory to pass over transgression. Again, in a marriage, in a relationship, we need to be able to show forgiveness one to another and not just let every little thing bother us. And, you know, even sometimes if you say, well, yeah, but I'm in authority and I'm the man and, you know, she's disrespecting me. You know what? Sometimes you still just need to let that stuff go, too. I'm not saying it's right. And no one's saying, oh, it's okay for the what? You know, like, no, it's not okay. It's not right. And that is uh, disrespectful, dishonoring if, if they're, you know, saying things like that. But at the same time, you know what? Show, show the long suffering that Christ had. Show the long suffering that the Lord has towards us. Because while, yes, there is judgment for, for sins and stuff, hey, there's also long-suffering and mercy and grace, which I think far outweighs, especially in the teaching of the Bible, the God's goodness, God's grace, God's mercy, God's long-suffering, than the wrath does. The wrath is there. It's, it's real, okay? Look, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. But you know what? Praise the Lord for his grace and mercy, because his mercy endureth forever. So we need the right balance and we need to understand. And look, let's just keep going. I'm going to get to that point later. Proverbs 14, verse 17, the Bible says, He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly. If you're, if you're quick to get angry, you're going you're to end up doing foolish things. And a man of wicked devices is hated. 
Proverbs 21, 19 says it is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. And, you know, the Bible is just teaching there that it's better, right? It's better than it is, you know, if you've got a contentious and an angry woman around, it's better just to be away from the contentious and angry woman. It's what the scripture says. That's pretty straightforward and simple. I don't know why it would be difficult to understand. It is better to be away from someone who's just really angry and contentious than it is to be in the presence, right? Now, look, if this is going on in your marriage, and you say, well, I'm married to an angry and contentious woman, well, you're going to need to figure out how to work on that, right? You're going to need to figure out how to help your wife to not be an angry and contentious person, right? And, and try to do so in a way that's not condescending. Try to do so in a way that's not going to be provoking. Try to do so in a way that can actually help your spouse, help your wife, right? Because isn't that what, that's the goal. And you know, that's the goal with all scripture and that's the goal with all rebukes when there's things that are being done that are wrong and need to be corrected by scripture. The goal is because you care about the person and you love them. It's not because you're attacking and you, you hate them, right? The whole point is to get right. And we ought to be viewing our marriages as, you know, hey, that's my spouse. That's my love. That's my, you know, my husband, my wife, and not view them as your enemy, that, that, I mean, if you got to that point, man, that's, you're in really bad shape. But say, hey, seek help. Proverbs eleven sixteen, the Bible says, A gracious woman retaineth honor, and strong men retain riches. The merciful man doeth good to his own soul, but he that is cruel troubleth his own flesh. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And here's another little practical piece of advice also, especially if things are getting bad to the point where you, you, you know, you're feeling like there's some love lost in your marriage and you have that, that serious conflict. And I recommend this. And even if you don't have that, I still recommend doing this because this is going to be helpful anyways. Pray for each other. Pray for your spouse every single day. I would say even twice a day. Pray for your spouse in the morning. Pray for him. Pray for their good. Pray that God will bless them. Pray that God will help them. And if you see some problem and you think that your spouse has some area that they need to get better in, pray for that too, but pray for them, right? Pray for them and pray for them in the evening. And look, when you pray for people, and this is true of just all prayer, when, when you've got the, the prayer requests, right? And, and you're praying for people and you're actually doing it and not just like saying, oh yeah, I'll pray for you. No, when you actually pray for people and it actually is part of your life, you're going to find yourself caring for those people a lot more. You're going to be asking about, hey, what's going on with this person? Hey, how are things going here? Why? Because it's on your mind, because it's in your heart, because you're praying for that person. That's, that, and that's a secondary benefit. Obviously, praying to the Lord itself is just super important because God hears prayer. Because God is a God that will hear your prayer and can help you in all of these areas. That's, that's the, the first thing. That's the most important thing. But secondary, it's still good to get your heart towards your spouse. And by praying for them. And, and look, if you have to, you force yourself to do it. But start doing it. And I recommend that even outside of marriage, you know, you got people that you don't like very much, maybe in church, or people that you know, look, you're commanded to love your brethren. Right? Aren't we commanded to love our brethren? Amen. Every brother and sister in Christ, we're commanded to love that person, whoever it is. And maybe there's people you don't like that much. Maybe there's people that bother you. Maybe there's people that say things about you you don't like, or maybe, you know, whatever. People can treat you bad, but you're still commanded to love that person. Pray for them. Pray for them. It's good. And that's, and that's a whole other sermon I could really go up. All these scriptures are just going off in my mind right now about praying for people. Even, even if they're considered your enemy, God forbid, you're, you're, you know, you're, someone's considered an enemy, that would be a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ, but you still pray for them. Ephesians chapter 5. So, conflicts in marriage. We've gone over a few things, counseling, anger. Um, but the, and this one's super important, and this is this is really fundamental to marriages, is getting in your proper role, okay? And this is going to be taught, and I and I teach this all the time. And I know, 
There's word going around that I'm a feminist, but you could be the judge of that. And we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 5. I like to consider myself a biblicist. Maybe I'm not perfect at it, but I really try to go with what the Word of God says and, and whatever. I don't care what the culture says. I don't care what the world says. It's what the Bible says that matters. And this is, you know, this is also a reason why in Christian marriages it can also be very difficult and you could have conflicts in marriage is because the world does teach very different when it comes to the roles within the family. And what we call them is traditional roles because this is how many people used to live their lives and, and have their marriage function, but it's not that way anymore. So there's a lot more pressure and stress from outside in the world and things to not do things the way the Bible says, but here's what the Bible says. And I want you to pay particular attention to the wording in Ephesians, and we're also going to look at Colossians 3 because they're kind of parallel passages, but these are directives given to each person in the family. In Ephesians 5, it's the husband and the wife. And in Colossians 3, we'll see others as well. But the instruction is for that person. We're going to start reading in verse 22. So who's directed at here? Wives. So this is a command of the Bible to wives. This isn't a command of the husband to the wife. This is a command of the Bible to the wife. Right? So here's wives. You want to be a good wife? You want to do what's right? You want to be in the proper role? Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Amen. And you know what? When, when, when women, when wives are in this role, God is going to bless your marriage a lot more than when you're not, right? This is, this is how, you know, the Bible teaches us how to have a good life, how to have a happy life, how to be, uh, you know, God, look, God wants us to have joy, love, peace, long, you know, the fruits of the Spirit, you know, from walking in the Spirit. God wants all those things for us in our life. And we have all the commandments, we have the law that teaches us how to avoid the dangers of sin, how to avoid the misery and, and, and just, just everything that's bad and death, you know, like, like, like everything is, is the, the, the law is here for our benefit, is what I'm trying to say, not for, uh, not for us to have no fun in this life, right, as, as some people might try to put it like, oh yeah, you can't have any fun because you, you know, we follow the rules of the Bible, no, it actually, if you, if you put it into practice, it, it actually is going to bring you joy. It's actually, it's actually a really good life to live. And this is no different. So the roles that are laid out here in the Bible, it's no different. So why have submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord? That's putting yourself in full, total submission to your husband. And look, I will say this, is that everything that we do because we have a free will is voluntary. Like you have to choose to do this. You have to choose to obey God. You have to choose to obey your husband. You have to choose to do these things. Now, look, if you don't, yeah, you're wrong. You're in error, but it's still, it's obviously always our choice. And, and just because something says so doesn't mean people always do that. So if you're, if, you know, and I'm going to say this, if, if husbands, especially are having problems with their wives in this, in this aspect, yeah, you could remind them what the Bible says. It's a good thing to say, hey, but look, this is what the Bible says. But at the same time, you know, you need to help them so that their choice is going to want to do this. And there's many ways to do that also. It's not just fear of the rod or fear of the stick or whatever. Like, it's not just, it shouldn't just be a condemnation type of a thing. There's many ways to motivate people and to get people to see the truth and help people understand. Because look, this is good. And this shouldn't just be under duress or under threat of punishment that you just do this or, the, or else. It is beneficial for wives to submit to their husbands. It's going to be beneficial for the whole family. It's beneficial when you can support your husband and, and let him be the leader of the family and make the decisions and just give your full support to him. It, it is beneficial overall. Amen. And there does have to be someone in charge. And when you just keep on having arguments because you don't like what he's doing and everything else, it's not going to be good for the marriage. It's just, it's just not. And God ordained it to be this way, so that's the way that it is at the end of the day. 
but I hope you can at least see there is, there's more value into obeying this and submitting yourself unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. And, and there, you know, there's a lot more. You know, I want to get so much more in depth on all these things, but I only have so much time. and There's a lot of content I want to cover. So let's keep reading here. Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. So that's putting the authority, the headship of the husband, right? There it is. That's spelled out. The husband has the authority in the home, even as Christ is the head of the church. So a good way of looking at this is say, well, hey, how much authority does Christ have over the church? Well, that's how much authority that the husband has at home. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. And it's a pretty broad statement. And it is broad on purpose because that's the authority that God has given to the husband within the home. Now, that's a power that's ordained of God. Clearly. But what you do with that power and how you deal with your spouse matters a lot. Okay? Just because you're granted this realm of authority doesn't mean you can just do whatever you want and think you're right with God as a husband. The authority is there that the wife is supposed to submit herself and listen to you. But that doesn't mean that you can literally just do anything and say, well, it's fine. Because you have your own commandment. And here's a commandment from the Lord. Husbands, love your wives. And, and it's going to tell you how. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So how is a husband supposed to love their wife? You say, you know, before you get all hung up as a husband on, well, my wife isn't submitting to me in everything. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty extreme statement in everything, right? Well, you know what? This is also pretty extreme. Hey, love your, are you loving your wife like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it? Because that's also a really high standard. A really high standard. I mean, that we, don't, we can't love like Christ loved because we have this wicked flesh. I mean, we, just, we, we simply can't attain to that. So if you think that your wife is going to always submit to you in every single case as unto the Lord all the time, you're dreaming. Now look, it doesn't make it right. I'm not justifying being di you know, disobedient just as much as I'm not justifying not loving your wife as Christ loved the church. But let's also have the grace and the long suffering and mercy to know on both sides, hey, they're not going to be perfect. So let's learn how to deal with imperfect people and do things the best we can. Yes, this is the standard. Yes, this is what we're striving for. Yes, this is what we're going to teach. Yes, this is what we're going to try to do in every aspect. But ugh, can we really do that? You know, we're trying. We're trying and not justifying things um, that aren't right. So look, the, the love as Christ, how did Christ love the church? Well, he gave himself for it. He suffered he bled. He died. Any negative consequences coming, you know, he'd bear that on himself. he bear the sins of the whole world. he bear our sins, the sins of the church, right? Everyone who's washing his blood, he took the brunt of everything. If there's anything negative that was going to happen, he took it in order to protect his, we'll call this a spiritual wife, okay, the church. So if he's going through and enduring all of that stuff to keep us safe, to keep us protected, to give us grace, isn't that how we ought to be loving our wife and viewing our wife as someone that says, hey, I'm going to take all of the hardship. I'm going to take all of the brunt. I'm going to take all of the affliction. I'm going to take whatever it is. I'm going to work my fingers to the bone. I'll make sure that I have to endure all the hardships as the husband. Why? To keep my wife safe because I love her because I want to protect her, because I want the best for her, because she's dear to my heart. You know, we love God because he first loved us. And I think, you know, when, when we look at, well, why is it that we obey Christ? Why are you here today? Why do you want to serve Christ? Why? Why? Are you, are you all just here today? Because if you don't, you fear that you're just going to be like, that might be part of it. 
That might be part of it, but is that really the main driving factor in what motivates you to get up and be happy to come to church? I mean, if, 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 I was, if my only thing, if my reasoning was, well, if I don't go to church, I'm just going to be severely chastised, punished, disciplined, and like, if I looked at everything in my spiritual life in that lens, I would not be serving joyfully. I'd be very scared all the time. But look, there's a lot more reason than that. And look, is that an aspect of it? Sure it is, but it's not, it shouldn't be the driving force. It shouldn't be the driving factor. And when you really want to get people to follow you and get people motivated, well, what is it that Christ did for us? He loved us, even though we were sinners. He loved us and, and died for us and, and paid for our, our sins. That, that should be one of the biggest reasons to say, hey, thank you. We're gracious. We're, we have gratitude towards you for, for making this great sacrifice, for loving us so much. I want to serve you. I want to do what's right. You have the words of truth. You have this wisdom. You have all of this for me. And I can see the benefit in serving God. Yeah, I want to be here. I want to change my life. I want to do what's right. It's really motivating. It's really joyful. It's really a good reason to, to get in and, and serve and really be committed to serving Christ. And when you think about it through that lens, you go like, well, what can I do now? to be more Christ-like, to get my wife on board with serving me that way, right? And the more you can demonstrate and show, hey, this is for our benefit. I'm doing this because I love you, because I love the family, because, you know, and, and they could see the benefit of serving you, the more they're going to want to. That's going to help get the heart right. Because at the end of the day, you need, you need the heart you can go through the motions out of fear, but if the heart's not in it, it's almost like, what good is it? What good is it if you don't have the heart? It's just, it's just, it's just going through motions. And the root to, to just about every problem is going to lie in the heart. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. So just as much as you as a man, hey, do you take care for your own body? Do, would, you, would you cherish and, 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 and want to do, see good for yourself? Well, that's how you ought to see, uh, you know, your wife is, is one flesh with you, but he's, and then he says also, even as the love of the church, doesn't, doesn't the Lord love and nourish and cherish the church? Doesn't he want to see our growth and our benefit and, and everything well for us? This should be reflected in the marriage. It is that type of love. And, you know, no healthy church should be walking, having to walk on eggshells of just being in fear that you might do or say just something wrong or else you're out. You should, that's, that's not healthy. And I would say the same thing in a marriage. That's not healthy. You need to get the heart right. You need to have enough grace and, and, and love there. Let's flip over to Colossians 3 real quick. Actually, you know what? We're going to bypass Colossians 3. I really don't want to, but I'm... Turn to Genesis chapter 2. There's just, there's just too much I want to get to. Colossians 3 really is, uh, is parallel with Ephesians 5. It's not identical, but it, it is very similar. It sums it up a lot quicker. While you're turning to Genesis 2, maybe I'll just read a few verses. Colossians 3.18 says, you know, man, there's so much I want to get into out of Colossians 3, but one of the points of, of Colossians 3 in the context before and after the summary of wives loving, submitting to the husbands and the husbands loving their wives, 
is whatsoever you do in verse 17, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. And then it goes into wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, that is as fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. And then it goes into servants. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And then it ends here in verse 23, not ends, but in this, this context. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. So the, the, this encapsulation of these instructions to wives and husbands and children is, is bookmarked on each end with whatsoever you do, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. So these are things that we should be doing with the Lord in mind that, hey, I'm going to be the best wife that I can be, and I'm going to be the best wife for the Lord's sake, not just for man's sake, not just for my husband's sake. I'm going to be the best husband that I can be, not just for my wife's sake, but for the Lord's sake as well. Children, I'm going to be the best child I can be, not just for my parents' sake, but for the Lord's sake. Because all that we do, look, this is part of our testimony. This is part of our, what the Bible says, communication is part of our life that we, that we should be living out the truths of the Bible and that everything that we do, it should be as unto the Lord. And we should do, and look, you can't control the other people like in your life. You can't control them. They said before, we, we have choices to make. So you, you, you could only force so much, and we shouldn't be seeking to force, right? Just like when we go out soul winning, you can't force people to get saved as much as, well, hey, but that would be a good thing. Yeah, it would be a good thing if they could get saved, but you just can't do it. You just can't force it. And the more you try to force it, the more you're actually going to be pushing people away, right? The more, you know, the more you just try to be like talking to people that don't really want to talk to you and stuff, you're, you're going to make them angry and upset and just be like, no, like, you know what? Maybe there's another time to come back to that. Forcing doesn't work. And, you know, again, that's going to be taken out of context. It's not, obviously, there's, you know, you force your kids to do certain things. You're going to have to teach and instruct them. But what, what, but what are we striving to do is get the heart, right? Like, I don't want to have to, if I have to force my children to come to church every week, which I will do as their parent because it's important and they're going to be here, but if it's, if, it's a, if it's that I have to force them always to come to church and they just never want to come to church, they don't like church, as soon as they're out of the house, guess what they're going to do? I'm not going to church now. We need their heart. Right? That's what you're striving to do. So yeah, in the short term, you may be like, okay, well, I'm forcing this because I'm your dad and you're coming to church. Right? You're doing this. You're, you're, you're going to read your Bible. You're coming out soul with me. But we need to figure out, we need to work with them. You need to, to care about them and love them and focus on like, well, hey, I, I want to make sure I get through to their heart. Because that's what's going to last. Genesis chapter 2, and again, another piece of advice, another piece of wisdom when it comes to conflicts and marriages is to never talk bad about your spouse because you have to realize that you are one. You are one flesh. You are one team. You are joined together. And what happens when you start talking about your spouse to other people is if you're talking to your family or talking to your friends, they always view it as, well, I love you and I'm on your side. So I'm going to hear what you have to say and then reinforce a division or a splitting and reinforcing a you, this side versus this side. That's not good because it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause more of a split. You need to view it as, no, we, we're one. We're one. We're one team. We're one flesh. We're, we are together. There's a union here. So when you seek the counsel, it's not to be, you know, talking bad about people. And we'll read what Genesis says here about, you know, when Eve was even created. But viewing your marriage as a true marriage, as a union, you have to keep that in your mind. That has to be forefront and, and lose this idea of, of splitting as individuals. 
Because once you've been joined together, you're, you're no longer individual. Look at verse number 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground, the Lord formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found in help meat for him. And meat just means suitable. Right? I know people throw around this word help meat, help meat, help meat like it's one word. It's not one word. It's a help that is suitable for Adam. Because the beasts aren't suitable. It's not a suitable companion to have a dog or an ox or whatever, just you know, anything as to be man's companion. Because why? The animals could be great beasts of burden, right? Great laborers, but they're not good companions or partners. And God said that, look, I, mean, look, I don't care how much you love your dog. I got dogs too. But that's still not what God intended with, you know, talking about the man being alone. No, you need more than that. And you need more than just something that can do your work for you. And look, this is inherent to how we view our wives, Right? Yes, Adam needs help, right? But he needs a help that's suitable for him because it's not just about doing the work and that's it. You're just a worker to me. You're just like a servant to me. No, that's not why a woman was created. Just to be some, uh, you know, just viewed as just like you're just above an animal or something. Verse 21, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. So it's, it's showing us God uses this example. God created woman on purpose to take the rib out of man because it is a part of his flesh that Jen gets rejoined in that marriage. To really view and conceptualize like, hey, this is how important our wives are, right? As men, as husbands, that this is our flesh. And that's why Ephesians 5 also says that you love your wife like your own flesh because that's how you ought to be treating one another. And this is a unique relationship. This is not like fathers and children. It's not like anything else. It's not like government. It's not like any other relationship at all. A husband and a wife is unique. Very unique. So you can't compare it to other ways of dealing with things necessarily. Right? This is specific and it's a unique relationship. How you view your spouse matters. start. Okay, I got a little bit of time left. So I normally have a, a like a little timer up here. Thank you. All right. Now let's get to the topic of husbands ruling their houses well. Because there are many ways to lead. And just going to a secular example for a minute, just as, as in terms of re, you know, rulers or leaders, you could think of people in political authority, kings, presidents, whatever, right? Just out in the world. And look, it's not identical to a marriage, but you could still say, okay, well, especially a king has kind of this supreme authority in a land, right? Similar to a husband having this supreme authority over his wife, right? Now, depending on your definition of success, we could look at many leaders who were successful in that they were able to get people to do what they told them to do. So if it's just a matter of making sure someone does what you tell them to do, there's many leaders who have done that in the past, but many leaders that I would also would not consider to be great, like good leaders or great leaders. And one that just kind of blaring in my mind would be like Joseph Stalin. Did he get a bunch of people to do things and to go and to fight? And you know, Yeah, he did. 
But if you know anything about the consequences for disobeying, you know, like people in the Russian army and the, the Soviet, you know, it, it, you had severe consequences there. And there were people led and ruled by fear. Now, did he get people to do what he told them to do? Absolutely. He led people to, even to slaughter and he had people do all kinds of horrific things. But does that make him a good leader? I don't think so. I mean, I, he got people to do stuff, yes, but how did he do it? Did he really have their hearts or minds? No, because at the end of the day, even with, with communism, you know, people that are under oppression don't want to be under oppression and they revolt and they rebel. And that's what you get when you're leading by oppression. That's what's going to happen. That's the outcome. We see it out in the world and you're going to see it in the home as well. Leading. Also, you even just think in the workplace, you know, there's, there's people who are, I call them a, a boss in name only. And you may have experienced this before. I surely have. You got the guy that wants to, the, the position, wants to be a manager, wants to be, and it's usually like middle management too. It's, it's not, I don't see this as much in the higher levels, but like these, these people that just want to be like in control of other people. And I, I, I literally had this happen with someone, there's like some nepotism going on, a job I used to work at. And you come in and like try to tell people what to do and no one listened to him. Now look, servants obey your master. So if someone's in that position, what's right, you should do what they say. I mean, that's, that's what would be right from the servant perspective, right? But if you're the boss and if you're in charge, you have to, you need to get people to want to listen to you and not just bark out orders to them, right? Like people aren't gonna respect you for that. People aren't gonna respect you for, and, and if people don't have your respect, then they're not going to want to follow you. I mean, it just kind of makes sense, right? So look, we got to take these, these principles and just think about this stuff and just con common sense stuff and apply it also in the home. The Bible teaches... I'll turn if you go to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Even within the home, so like... Proverbs 29, 21 is a really insightful proverb. And I'll read this for you. You're turning to 1 Peter 3. The Bible says, He that delicately bringeth up his servant from a child shall have him become his son at the length. So someone who is being brought up as a servant, and, and you, know, you, could, you might be able to swap that out as a slave or an indentured servant, as a bond servant, right? Someone who would be brought up in a house. And this, this aspect of it might be harder for us to kind of relate to because we don't have as much, you know, we don't have that going on really in our society. But think about someone who is not part of the family, someone who's just this servant. But he says, if you delicately bring up that servant from a child, he can be like a son to you. Why is that? Because you're, you're treating him with love. You're treating him with dignity. You're delicately bringing him up. You're not ruling over him with rigor. And the law actually has a commandment on ruling with rigor not being allowed. And that's in Leviticus 25. And I'll read this for you quickly because I don't want to spend too much time here. There's a distinction that's drawn between a brother and someone who was a heathen who was taken into captivity. And how the law expressed how you must deal with those people. So there's a difference if someone, you know, for one of the heathen nations that was conquered, that became a servant, right? There was one standard for that person in the scripture. But if someone became poor that was a brother and they became like a bond servant because they needed to work off their debt, they had to, to pay, you know, they had to become this servant. The Bible is really clear on how you were supposed to deal with those people, Okay. And this is important because of, because of some of the things that have been stated recently that, that I don't, I just want to make sure we're really clear and I just kind of don't leave anything unturned here. And, and I'll just come out and say it, because of the, the, the corporal punishment on spouses, on wives particularly, okay? I've taught about this before. I didn't think it was even that big of an issue when I taught on it. But the response that I've seen is insane to me, which is why I'm covering again. And not just for that reason, but because I literally know of people who were 
condoning that previously in our church. Unbeknownst to me, okay, this came out later. I found out this week that this was, this was actually suggested by people within the church that this should be done. Okay, so yeah, things that were, I never thought because of our culture, just because of I, what I call common sense, that I would have to cover stuff like this. I didn't think I would have to, but apparently I do. And I'm also preaching it here just to make dead sure that not just in Norcross, but our church plant here, where this church stands on this stuff. It's not tolerated whatsoever. Amen. And if we just see like, and, and you know what? Keep your place in 1 Peter 3. Look at Leviticus 25. There is a law about how you treat your bond servant. And look, I think the wife probably has a little bit better standing than the bond servant does. Hopefully we've made that clear already as flesh from Adam's flesh and becoming one again with marriage. Verse number 39 of Leviticus 25, the Bible says, And if thy brother that dwelleth by thee be waxen poor and be sold unto thee, thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bondservant. Look, even though that's what he is, right? He's being sold unto you. It's like your property because he's, he's working off a debt, but as an hired servant and as a sojourner, he shall be with thee and he shall serve thee unto the year of Jubilee. And then shall he depart from thee, both he and his children with him, and shall return unto his own family and unto the possession of his father shall he return. For they are my servants, which I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as bondmen, Thou shalt not rule over him with rigor, but shalt fear thy God. But he's my property. I can do whatever I want. That's my authority. It's my property. I can do this. I have the authority. Look, you shall not rule over them with rigor, but you shall fear thy God. Okay, this is stated about a bondservant. Both thy bondmen and thy bondmaids, which thou shalt have, shall be of the heathen that are round about you. Of them shall ye buy bondmen and bondmaids. Moreover, of the children of the strangers that do sojourn among you, of them shall ye buy, and of their families that are with you, which they begat in your land, and they shall be your possession. And ye shall take them as an inheritance for your children after you to inherit them for a possession. They shall be your bondmen forever. But over your brethren, the children of Israel, you shall not rule one over another with rigor. And we could get into all that other stuff another day about the, the servants and bond servants and, and everything else. But clearly there's a command to not rule over your brother who is a bond servant to you with rigor and you shouldn't treat him that way at all. You treat him as a hired servant, right? And we know what hired servants are like. I'm a hired servant. I have a job that I work. I work for a boss. I work for a company. I'm a hired servant. Do they have authority over me? Yeah, my boss has authority over me. Is it the same as in the home? No, not exactly the same as in the home, but I'm still working under an authority structure, right? Am I their property? No. But are there, if, I, if I'm disobedient, if I do things I'm not supposed to do, are there consequences that I'm going to face? Yeah. And of course, the, the final consequence at the end of the day would be you're no longer working for us, or you could be terminated as an employee, right? You could end, sever that relationship. Now, again, the relationship, the, 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 when you're applying this to marriages, this isn't one-to-one. -one. It's not identical because, you know, what are you going to do, divorce your wife? Well, no, you're not, you're not supposed to divorce your wife. You're not allowed to. It's not, it's not something that God is uh, saying that we should do. So what do you do then? What do you do if you're in authority and your wife doesn't obey? Well, just nothing then because you can't beat her. That's preposterous. That's ridiculous. Okay? And now, should we be beating our wives? No. No. They're not your children. And look, in the Bible, you are given authority. You're commanded to beat your children. There's authority for that. There is authority and commands given regarding the law and the punishment of fools. And people do, you know, things that are... That are 
against the law where they would be brought in a court and a judge would determine how many whippings they're going to get. That is also given. But if it's not given, if it's not granted of God, why would you just assume that you have this authority to now do this to other people? I mean, do I have the authority to start whipping people in church? I mean, look, there is, is there a level of authority in the church for the pastor? For the elder? Yep. The elders that would do what? Rule well? Are they ruling in the house of God? Absolutely. Well, the Bible's kind of silent about, you know, beating church members. So I guess it's just whatever. Don't condemn me for it. It's preposterous. And you know, it ought to be preposterous to think that you, you know, you should be beating your wife. Amen. Bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh. Not just that, but how about this? A sister in Christ. Look at verse number one of 1 Peter chapter three. So again, we're going to see the roles. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. So this is good advice too, by the way, on how a wife should behave if her husband is not right with God. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands that if any obey not the word, right? Talking about their husbands or maybe even just other wives, right? Other people, anyone that can see what's going on, they also may, without the word, be one. You win people over. You win their heart by what you do. It's a, look, you could win over your husband without the word. So, what, wives, you don't have to teach your husband the Bible. That's his job anyways. He's supposed to be the spiritual leader and teacher in the house. So how do you win him over? By being a really good, submissive wife. And they see how you behave and how you act. That can help win them over while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. And it is, and there should be a fear, a godly reverence for your husband. That ought to be there. And again, it's not that there's nothing that the husband can do, by the way, to, to exercise authority over the wife. Because the authority is there. But it should never have to resort to physical violence or abuse or whatever you want to call it. I don't like either of those words that much necessarily, but a physical beating. I mean, there's ways that you can, and look, this, is, this had to come up uh, you know, a couple times where you just say like, well, I'm the man. I'm not going to allow you to leave or something. Like you could take the car keys and look, that, is that a good situation to be in? No, but sometimes those things happen. You can, you can do things to just prevent anything else from happening, right? You can even just withholding money and stuff and say, okay, well, look, I'm providing, I'm working. Things need to be done this way. And you have the authority to do that. And I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that. But when it comes to, you know, treating your wife as if she's one of your children, I don't see that in scripture anywhere. And I think I see the exact opposite. We ought to be um, treating them better than that. Now let's keep reading here in 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse number three, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. So the example, one of the examples being given is of a godly wife who was submissive to her husband was Sarah. And Sarah and Abraham had a great marriage. And, and you know, the Bible says about Abraham, the Lord says about Abraham, that I know Abraham, that he's going to, uh, uh, you know, lead his family, he's going to train his children well. And I forget the exact phrasing of it when... Um, right around the time of like Genesis 19, right? The story of Sodom and Gomorrah, it's right, it's right around that passage that he says like, like I know, he was debating whether or not he was going to let Abraham know what was going on. 
And he says, well, I know him, and I know he's going to lead his family well. And he had a great, you know, if we're going to look at good example of, of husband and wife in Scripture, overall it's going to be Abraham and Sarah. Now, did they make their mistakes? Sure they did, but um, we can see clearly Sarah obeyed Abraham enough to call him Lord. He's like the boss. She viewed him as, no, you're in charge. And when you look at the, the supporting passage for that, she called him Lord in her heart. So it was, it was in her heart. She really genuinely was looking at her husband that way, not just in the lips. That's how she viewed him, as, as being the one in charge, that she, she gave him that reverence. Look at verse 7, though. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. So we, we look at this and, you know, does, it, does the Bible say you have to give honor unto your children? You have to give honor unto your children. You give honor unto your wife, though. It's a different relationship. It's not the same. Dwell with them according to honor, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. We already know she's weaker. But because she's weaker, she needs your strength. And as being heirs together of the grace of life. In Christ, the Bible says there's neither male nor female, right? Hey, on earth, is there authority structure? Yes, there is. But you still view your, your, your wife as being heirs together of the grace of life. And then he says that your prayers be not hindered. That's important. We'll get to that in just a minute. I'm going to read just two verses from Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. The Bible says, Thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes, with one chain of thy neck. How fair is thy love, my sister, my spouse. How much better is thy love than wine and the smell of thine ointments than all spices. I mean, read all of the Song of Solomon. Obviously, it's great poetry. It's great love song for husbands and wives. But just in this passage, just notice he says, my sister, my spouse. He's not saying that because it's his physical sister. Right? He's treating her as joint, hey, you're a sister and my spouse, right? And that's the love that we see there that needs, and look, you want to get your marriage right? Treat your wife that way. And this is regardless of, of enforcing rules or anything like that in the home, just like this is going to help your marriage when you can view your wife as your sister and your spouse, as someone who's joint heirs together with you of the grace of God. Verse number 8, 1 Peter 3 says, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love is brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing. And look, this is just, be ye all of one mind. right? This is, this is now gone beyond just husbands and wives. right? Be all of one mind. Have compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful, meaning showing pity and being courteous. This is how we ought to be treating people, especially brothers and sisters in Christ in general, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they, should, they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. We should always be seeking peace. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And I'm, it's hard to ignore the correlation between verses 7 and verse 12. Because verse 12 is talking about the eyes of the Lord being over the righteous. His ears are open unto their prayers. But he's against them that do evil. And evil is, by definition, bringing harm unto others. Likewise, ye husbands, of verse 7, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and being heirs together, grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Both verses are talking about the prayers um, being heard. And I don't think it's that far of a stretch to say that we shouldn't be doing evil unto our wives, that our prayers be not hindered. So, yeah, you know what? This is, 
There's always so much more to say on these things. I can't believe how much time I've already spent. Actually, I kind of can. And I don't want to have to preach on this in a long time, and I think everyone here hopefully gets it because this is not something to take lightly. And, and, and what I've already seen happen when, when, when this can't be condemned is now we're going to have a whole bunch of marriages with men beating their wives. And you say, but, well, show me, the, show me the pastor that said that you should beat your wife. It's not out there. It's not there. I'm not saying that it is there. But when, but when the language and the, and the wording is being promoted is saying, well, I can't really condemn it. Well, I don't endorse. Well, now it's just totally an opinion, which to me is, is ridiculous to say it because the same people are, are saying that or using that argument will totally say that all of these other things that aren't expressly stated in the Bible are also wrong and sinful because we use the biblical principles to show why it's wrong and why you shouldn't do that. I mean, I could think of a million examples of things that aren't in the Bible literally. They're not literally stated as don't do this. But you would never hear anyone saying, well, I mean, you, you know, if you say that you can't do that, then you're just twisting scripture. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. And this is no different. This is no different than saying people shouldn't be smoking weed or snorting cocaine or whatever. And you say, well, it's not, it's not actually found in the Bible. Well, yeah, you know what? It is, though. It is. The principles are there. Even just the, the, the doctrines on, on drunkenness is applicable, right, to these other areas. It's, it's, it's not. And something like marriage, rearing children, the most basic things to humanity. Yeah, the Bible tells us everything we need to know about it. And I would say, you know, inflicting physical harm on other people is something that if it's not authorized, you should never assume that you have that right. That right is given only to a certain extent. God authorizes government to inflict, for example, capital crimes, right? Hey, death penalty, but it's, it's by man. But yeah, it's all done in order, and it was given specifically by God. Like in the beginning, that wasn't allowed, right, until after the flood. And then God said, okay, now this is allowed. So did anyone have the right to do that before? Nope. Not until it was granted. Do you have the right to, to, to spank or beat your children? Yes, you do. Because that's granted in Scripture. Do I have the right to beat you as church members in my realm of authority? No, that's not granted. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the great words of wisdom that we can find in the Holy Bible. I pray that you would please, Lord, ultimately help us to have great marriages. Help us to be honoring to you in our lives, in our marriages, Lord. And this life isn't easy, and we know that a lot of people, we, you know, we can struggle, we can have fights and arguments and things, Lord, but I pray that you would please help us to use the wisdom from your word. Help us to get our hearts right, Lord. Husbands and wives alike, help us to get right that we can commit ourselves to being the best Christian, the best husband, the rest, best wife, respectively, dear Lord, um, that we can ultimately just, just win over people by that communication, by being a good example, Lord, and ultimately also receiving all the, the benefits and blessings of having a godly marriage. Lord, I pray that you would please help us to just do what's right, to help us to help others, Lord, that might be struggling in these areas. And um, Lord, everything that we do here, we do for your honor and your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.